Group theory is composed of many group families, but there are five which are foundational. To explain how each is built, we need to start with symmetry. We call something symmetric when it looks the same from more than one point of view. If we take a starfish, every 72 degrees, it looks like it did 72 degrees before. Well, in order to generalize it, we need to set up three conditions. First, we identify all the parts of an object that are similar and give it a number. Second, we try to find the actions we can perform with the object that can rearrange the numbered parts while always taking up the same amount of space. And third, map all the possible combinations. This is not very practical in mathematical terms. So how about we remove the rectangles and only show the annotations? The diagram switched from talking about configurations to talking about actions. It's pretty much like switching from nouns to verbs. The dashed arrows show the vertical flip, while the solid ones are horizontal flips. We can simplify it even further, and instead of entire phrases, we select colors and letters. These endpoints are called nodes. The first one we select is the start node, which we label as N. The arrows become lines. Even though they'll be missing the arrowheads, we'll still call them arrows. The blue represents a horizontal flip and ends at the B node for blue. The red represents a vertical flip and ends at an R node for red. But we know that we don't use a diagram every time we want to represent relationships. We actually express them algebraically. If we take a look at the diagram again, we see that R followed by B is equivalent to B followed by R. Both of these end up at the RB node. Thus, more concisely, this is expressed as RB equals BR. That's obviously a very simple example. But here's something really important. What we just drew is a group, its visualization. More specifically, it is known as a Klein 4 group V4. By the way, all of the nodes are its elements. So when we say N is an element of V4, we express it like that. N belongs to V4. By the way, we're not going to go into the four properties that define a group, because we don't really need to discuss it extensively in this video. But if you'd like to know more about them, I've linked a video in the description below, you can check it out. And if you're enjoying this video, please do not forget to like it and to subscribe to the channel. The Klein 4 group belongs to the family of abelian groups. But before delving into them, we need to see a more fundamental family of groups, called cyclic groups. They're the most fundamental because they only have rotational symmetry, meaning there's only one thing you can do to a cyclic group, rotate it. Cyclic groups are commonly named CN, and the index will be the number of elements, or their order, which replaces the N. Usually we'd give one of the nodes an identity zero, because rotating a propeller with N blades N times leads us back to the starting point, which is essentially the same as never having rotated it. Thus, algebraically, C5 is represented like this. Every rotation, to whichever direction we choose, it can't be both directions, is one in this case. So every element of the group is generated by repeatedly adding one. But the numbers don't increase infinitely. After we reach four, we go back to zero. This is what is known as modular addition. Four would otherwise be known as n minus one, since four plus one equals five which completes the cycle by bringing us back to zero. If we were to represent that on a Cayley table, we'll see that clearly in cases like 2 plus 3 equals 0, or 4 plus 3 equals 2. Like we mentioned before, the other families can be built up from cyclic groups. So, in order to understand how, we need to understand how we can find cyclic groups in other types of groups. Consider the diagram as 3. We'll discuss exactly what S3 is a little bit later. The blue arrows mean rotate, or R. If we start at the identity element E, we see that on the outside, an exact copy of C3 is traced. Remember, C3 is like the cyclic group C5 that we drew previously, except this one has three elements instead of five. The term for that is orbit of R. They're usually written together like a set. All cyclic groups are abelian, which naturally leads us to the abelian group family. And actually, abelian groups can be constructed from cyclic ones. Abelian groups are those in which order of action is irrelevant. Recall our earlier example of V4. If R and B are any two actions in an abelian group, then the action R followed by the action B yields the same result as B followed by R, represented by the earlier RB equals BR. 
This is read as our commutes would be. So abelian groups are commutative. This means that if we follow the blue, then the red arrow in the diagram, it leads us to the same point as following the red, then the blue arrow in the diagram. This may seem obvious to identify visually, but what if we take a look at these two very similar diagrams? One is D4, the other is C2 times C4. If we take a closer look and follow the red-blue pattern, the D4 leads us to a different node than the blue-red pattern. So RB cannot equal BR, but the other group does. They're also pretty easy to spot on Cayley diagrams, since they pretty much mirror each other. If you were to fold the table in half diagonally, the elements that touch would be identical. Recall that cyclic groups only have objects that demonstrate rotational symmetry. Well, what if we want to rotate it and flip it over? Is there a group for that? Yes, the dihedral groups, which can be spun and flipped. Dihedral groups describe objects which also have bilateral symmetry, meaning that they look the same when reflected. They're usually written as dn. All the actions we can do in cn are also actions in dn, because it involves rotation. But since d permits flipping, there are twice as many actions in dn as there are in cn. In dihedral groups, for any possible rotation, there's a possible flip. If we take an equilateral triangle and number all of the angles, we can rotate it, which will be equal to C3. That clockwise rotation can be called R, our copy of C3 being the orbit of R. But we can also flip it. By flipping the triangle, we get additional three positions, bringing up the total to six. The outer rings for DN diagrams are orbits of R and are copies of cyclic groups CN. They are rotated clockwise. The inner ring is also a rotation, but counterclockwise. The F action connects the inner and outer rings. The multiplication table shows that quite clearly, where we can divide it into four very distinct quadrants in this example of D5. We can call them flip and non-flip. We see this relationship play out. Okay, well, so far we've been pretty stuck with our shapes. But what happens if we want to rearrange the elements of a group? These rearrangements are part of the two last group families that we'll talk about. Symmetric and alternating groups. Rearrangements are actually called permutations. They are the perfect group building tool because they satisfy the four conditions of a group. They have a predefined list of actions that never changes, each of which is not open to more than one interpretation. Any sequence of a consecutive action is also an action, and every permutation is able to be reversed. You remember when we mentioned S3 previously? Well, the S stands for symmetric. Sn represents the group of all permutations of n things, or a symmetric group. S3 is the only symmetric group we've encountered so far. It's quite small, but the larger they get, the more intriguing they become. Their size increases incredibly quickly. The n in Sn is factorial, the official definition of which is the product of all whole numbers from 1 to n. Meaning that if you take a factorial, you multiply that by all the whole numbers that precede it up to 1. After S5, the Cayley diagrams become really hard to draw, but S4 is still pleasantly arranged. Here we have four elements. We have four factorial, so 24 possible permutations. The red arrow represents the permutation 2 goes to 4, 4 goes to 3, and 3 goes to 2. The blue represents the permutation 1 goes to 2, and 2 goes to 1. Despite the fact that a collection of elements forms a group, creating a group of permutations does not necessarily require taking all the permutations of a given size. It is still possible to form a group using just some of the permutations of Sn. One way to do that is through an alternating group, which takes exactly half of the elements of Sn, but not a random half. The alternating group An is made up of the even permutations from Sn. Take this example. It demonstrates how each permutation in S3 behaves when squared. When we square a permutation, we are effectively applying it twice in succession. One is the identity permutation 1, 2, 3, or simply ID. Squaring it means ID times ID, which equals ID. So the result is the identity, no change. It's the first element since it's the identity. Then we have two element swaps. Swap elements 1 and 2, 
squaring it means 1, 2 times 1, 2, which equals the identity. Because swapping twice undoes the swap, it is still the identity. So it is an odd permutation. Same goes for the second and third swap. Now the fifth and sixth produce two different transpositions. 1, 2, 3 times 1, 2, 3 is 2, 3, 1. 1, 2 followed by 2, 3. Therefore, it is even. The same goes for the last. 1, 3, 2 times 1, 3, 2 equals 3, 1, 2. It is even because it can be expressed as two transpositions, 2, 3 followed by 3, 1. We apply 1, 3, 2 to 1, 2, 3 because it is like the backwards or counterclockwise rotation applied to all three elements. Like saying 3, 2, 2, 2, 2, 1 and 1, 2, 3. So out of the six possible permutations, we get three. So A3. Visually, the Cayley diagrams for alternate groups will be the half of the permutation of symmetry groups. Like this A4 arranged on a truncated tetrahedron is the half of this S4 truncated octahedron. All of this leads us to Cayley's theorem, which states that all of group theory can be found in permutations. We don't have time to talk about it now, but if you're interested in a video dedicated to it, please let us know in the comments section below. This video was inspired by this book. Check it out in the link in the description. And don't forget to check out the PDF in the description. Remember, you only get good at math by learning and practicing all by yourself. So check out the PDF. The groups we've mentioned are just five of the foundational group families, but the list can go on to include others, one of which are Lee groups. Check this video out if you want to know more about them. See you there.